Welcome to the Man Cave Podcast with Dan Casper. What up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of the Man Cave Podcast brought to you by hy V and Toys and Ford. And shout out to our swag provider, Resonance Branding Company. On this uh, quick episode of the podcast, we're going to talk some brewers. Brewers sweeping the Redbirds, the St. Louis Cardinals this past weekend. I want to talk a little bit about Pat Murphy, too. But uh, we're going to lead things off talking some Milwaukee Bucks picking up a win in Game 1 against the Indiana Pacers. Let's face it, they weren't favored into this game, and from a lot of Bucks fans or from even national people out there, there wasn't uh, a whole lot of confidence whether this Bucks team could go win this series. Now it's just one game. I don't know if it necessarily changed the opinions of many. I know it didn't really change the opinion of one Mr. Sir Charles Barkley yesterday, or last night, I should say. But I, I had this weird feeling like I, I could see the Bucks coming in, you know, game one at home, kind of playing with uh, the underdog role, which is weird to say as them being a three seed and such. But I could kind of see them be like, ah, I could see them like just jumping out hot right away, jumping out to an early lead and, and taking game one. And it took a little bit. You could tell both these teams, I don't know if it was just a little rust from having some extra days off or whether it was just some nerves or that, but it just felt like, okay, getting some missed shots here. You know, it was kind of a little rusty there, but it ended up working out in game time. I mean, again, this is why you make a trade. For Damian Lillard, for a guy like Damian Lillard, when your top dude is out, Giannis, when he's out and he's missing some time, you need that next guy, that guy who could create his own, that guy who can kind of go out there and lead the team, put him on his shoulders, at least for a first half out there, right? Dame did that last night, 11 of 24 from the field, 6 of 11 from three, six rebounds. 35 points, all those points coming in the first half. And you could tell there was definitely a a change, a a defensive change from from the Pacers. And they're like, okay, (laughs) we're going to afford. And and you could say, why didn't they do this before? And I I would agree with that. I, I. Take Dame out, you double team him, and you try to force everybody else from this Bucks team to beat you. And I think think that's probably what Indiana is going to do to begin game two it's like all right we're just going to double team him we're going to trap him as many times as soon as he gets the ball whether it's an inbound we're going to double team him right away and force everybody else on this Bucks team to be the offense really to be the offensive go-to person don't know you know I mean Dame sometimes when he's just on and he's shooting from 35 feet or whatever it is deep behind the arc it's sometimes it's just like it's kind of almost like Caitlin Clark I'm not comparing it to but it's like you know kind of shrug your shoulders at that point but you could tell there was definitely a change in uh philosophy if you will or a game plan uh against Dame there but credit to to the other guys like Chris Middleton who finished the game with 23 points 10 rebounds also four dimes out there these are the two Damon Middleton. These are the two guys that have to go out there and lead this ball club until Giannis is back on that court. And even when Giannis is back on that court, yeah, you know, we'll we'll see how close to a hundred percent he could be. But you had guys hitting some big shots, you know. Patrick Beverly hit a big three. Uh, was it in the second half there? Be- uh, Beasley hitting a couple of big threes. Portis making a couple big plays. You had those guys, especially in the second half, making some shots. And when it looked like Indiana was, all right, making it a game and maybe getting a little momentum, Bucks go out there, make a couple big shots. Patrick Beverly making some plays, you know, whether it's dishing it. He finished with, with uh, eight assists there, diving on the floor. That one play was in the fourth quarter, diving on the floor and finding Beasley in the corner for for a quick three there. I mean, Beverly's that guy. I, he finished the game with a plus 17, plus or minus. Plus 17 there. So he's that guy. He's not going to give you a ton of offensive production, but he can affect the game in so many different ways. And I think you kind of saw that last night with this with this Bucks team. 
you know, the question is now can the Bucks in game two coming up tomorrow kind of repeat what they did in game one, bring that energy, especially on the defensive side? You know, Pascal Siakam had himself a game, and they're going to have to figure out, okay, how do we try to try to slow down that all-star? You know, Al, Al T- Turner had 17. They did a really good job. The Bucks did a really good job of limiting Tyrese Halliburton. He finished with just nine points, still had eight assists and, and uh, seven rebounds there. So, I mean, he was close to a triple-double. But they didn't let Tyrese Halliburton kind of go off. And I thought for the most part they did a good job of not allowing Indiana to consistently get into transition offense. We know the Pacers, they want to run up and down. They want to, you know, score quickly, light up the the scoreboard, get up and down that court quickly. And, and I mean, it wasn't perfect. There was a few plays, but for the most part, I thought the Bucks did a pretty darn good job. I mean, you're holding the Pacers to just 94 points, under 100 points, the highest scoring team in the NBA this past year or this this season. I mean, it helps with the Pacers going 8 of 38 from 3. There's no doubt about that. That helps out a little bit. But I also think you've got to give some credit to the defensive play and the effort from, from the Bucks last night. And depending on whether you're listening on the radio or whether you were watching it on the tube and such, you know, Grant Hill last night was was kind of talking about, you know, he mentioned it a few times, and I think it was Ian Eagle kind of mentioned it a few times too. You know, this Bucks team, whenever they were talking to them and Doc Rivers, they just mentioned about just how super confident they were heading into this game and heading into the series, even without Giannis. And, and considering how they finished the season, as Grant noted and a lot of others noted, you know, since Doc Rivers was hired, the team finished under 500, right? It was an under 500 record. So why would there be a lot of stuff to to be confident about? But maybe this is just a team that, you know, it's a it's the oldest team in the league based off average age, veteran heavy. They know what's at stake. They know it's all about the postseason. And that's kind of where they've had their eye on it. I use the example once in a while, but it, I think it kind of fits. It was like it's like those Spurs teams with Duncan and Ginobili and, and Tony Parker. Veteran teams, they just kind of I don't want to say coasted through the regular season because obviously you got to perform fairly well in the the postseason to, or in the regular season to get into the postseason. But they had bigger goals than just finishing for a one seed. It was postseason time. It was like they were using the regular season to tune up. For, for the postseason, if you will. Now I don't know if this Bucks team is going to be like that, if they're going to have a postseason like those Spurs teams did, where, you know, maybe they didn't finish as the top seed and top team in the West, but they kind of had that extra gear. They kind of flipped the switch when it came to the postseason. We'll see if the Bucks can do that. But nonetheless, it was an impressive victory, I thought, last night for this for this Bucks team. I just hope that they can continue because I wouldn't expect Giannis. You know, the more the Bucks too, you know, if, if the Bucks win game two, I think they kind of push the return of, of Giannis. Again, it's very kind of up in the air. Haven't really said seen a, a definitive timeline, and a lot of it's just going to be dependent on, you know, whenever he heals and, and starts to feel better and that calf starts to feel better over there. But the more the Bucks can win without him, the more that they can kind of delay his return and make sure he's as close to 100% as possible. But the big question for me now is going to be Game 2 tomorrow night. Can this Bucks team come out with that same type of energy to, to begin the game? Can they continue to be that aggressive both on the offensive side and the defensive side? And I think they've got to be prepared now. And I'm sure they will be. But they have got to be prepared for a Pacers team that's going to come out and say, we're just going to try to completely take out Dame time. We're going to double him every time. We're going to frustrate him. We're going to try to trap him. We're going to pick him up full court, half court. Going to make things super difficult on him. And we're going to try to force you, Milwaukee Bucks, to beat us. Going to force Chris Middleton to beat us. Bobby Portis to beat us. Brooke Lopez 
We're going to take your number one offensive threat out of this. Pacers, points-wise, opponents' points, bottom four in the league in the regular season. But if they dedicate a lot of their defensive energy to just one guy, you know, without Giannis, they could focus on one offensive guy for this Bucks team like they did in the second half against Dame. I would expect the Pacers to do this coming up in game two. And I think Doc Rivers and the Bucks know this too. So that puts even more pressure on a guy like Middleton to be maybe a go-to offensive dude. I mean, when when Middleton's offensive game is on and he's – you know, kind of doing a little fadeaways like he did last night. It's it's pretty. Let's be real. It's it's pretty. There was a couple of those shots last night. It made Dame and Giannis even stand up from the bench. You know, when he's kind of backing down the defender and he does a quick turnaround, little fadeaway mid-range, it's pretty when it goes in. That's his game. If he can get those matchups, get the ball to Chris Middleton. But if he can consistently knock those down, and try to force more attention his way to open up things for a guy like Damian Lillard, well then, it's it's a beautiful thing. But other guys, like Bobby Portis, are we going to get a Bobby Portis game where he's just on, you know, in fuego, on fire? Dude had a double-double yesterday. What kind of offensive production from Brooke Lopez, you know? So, Bucks have to be prepared for... The, the plan from, from the Pacers to just completely try to take Damian Lillard out of game two and force everybody else to, to beat them. That puts more pressure on Middleton. That puts more pressure on guys like Bobby Portis. You know, where is that offense going to come from if it's not from Damian Lillard? Bucks, I mean, you know, they put up 69 points in that first, uh, first half 35 of them coming from Dame okay in the second half in the second half alone Bucks just put up 40 14 in the third so they're gonna have to make sure to find that other offensive gear coming up against uh, against the Pacers and continue to play at a high defensive level too I, I think you got to give credit to the defensive play from from the Bucks last night all right, let's switch over here a little bit to to some Brewers chat. Brewers picking up a series sweep over the Cardinals. Going back to the extra innings uh, game on Friday night where they went to 10 innings. Brewers picking up a win, 2-1. to one. Then the bats coming alive on Saturday, 12-5 to five victory. Uh, D.L. Hall not having... Not having some great stuff on Saturday's game, but thanks to the offense, he was, you know, Reese Hoskins opening up with a two-run shot uh, over there. Jackson Cheerio also homering too. But uh, D.L. Hall getting sent uh, to the injured list. He apparently tweaked his knee in, uh, in, in that game on Saturday, but also his velocity was down too. And I want to get to a couple of Pat Murphy comments that he said about uh, D.L. Hall. And, and it's just, again, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about Pat Murphy coming up here in a second. So, I'll hold off on on that, but DL Hall getting sent down to uh, to the injured list here, and then yesterday the Brewers picking up a two to nothing victory. And Colin Ray, you know, five innings gets the no decision, but he went five innings, five hits, three Ks, three walks, no earned runs. You know, Hudson going out there in his hometown picking up his first career win in front of a lot of friends and family. Two and a third, striking out four, not giving up a hit. Blake Perkins making that sweet catch in the in the outfield center field, robbing a home run. I mean, defense and some timely hitting and some bats coming alive on Saturday for the uh, for, for the crew. It's just another impressive series for for the Brewers, right? Um. I mean, we can look at Contreras. Contreras continues to to have an amazing start. I mean, you're looking at the numbers. I know he went hitless yesterday. But you look at the numbers he's putting up this season so far, especially at the catching position. Still hitting 354. OPS is a 987. He's got four dingers. He's leading the team in home or in, in RBIs with 20. Leading the team in runs, 18. 
I mean, the guy is having a fantastic, I don't know what a, how else we could say it, he is having a fantastic start to the season and just continues to to impress and get better and better and better. And then you got Blake Perkins, who is making the most of his opportunity right now. The way he's playing, I don't care who gets healthier or not. You keep the man out there, defensively and even offensively. Make, making that catch in center yesterday. Right now he's hitting 354, OPS of a 968. He's got a couple of home runs in there too. 17 hits and 48 at-bats. Pat Murphy. Uh, this was from Todd Rosiak from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And this is where I appreciate Pat Murphy, and I know it's not a, a big thing as a coach, general manager, manager, whatever. You know, it's everybody's different. Some will be a little bit more open to, to the media, maybe a little bit more personable, or we see their personalities a little bit more. When it comes to general managers or managers or coaches – we only care about one thing. We just we want them to win as many games. That that's that's their number one. Put together a roster to, you know, hopefully win a lot of games. And if you're the coach or the manager, win a bunch of those games. But as fans, we like to see sometimes a coach or front office person, whatever, maybe have a little more, per, more personality, be a little bit more open. And we're getting that with Pat Murphy. I know we've kind of said that a few times, but there's just more and more that kind of comes out that's like, oh, I don't know if a guy like Craig Council would say stuff like that or be as open, uh, if you will. But Pat Murphy, I thought this was a really good piece. Uh, I'll just kind of read it a little bit here again. Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, Todd Rosiak. A baseball lifer, Pat Murphy has seen and experienced just about everything there is to experience in the game. But that doesn't mean he isn't still learning. Case in point, Blake Perkins. Murphy was entering his eighth year as bench coach of the Brewers in the spring of 2023 when he first laid eyes on Perkins, a career minor leaguer, uh, to that point who was well down the major league depth chart in the outfield. Murphy said, you kind of categorize guys. It's very dangerous. As young coaches, we come through and we think we kind of get a feel for our type of player. And I saw Blake Perkins and I'm like, he's not like into it. And I just didn't have the feel that he was going to be the type of guy I love. Dead wrong, and I love it. I love being wrong about it. This guy has emerged. I just love everything he does. It taught me. The lesson is to be careful about making judgments. And another case in point, too, where where, where, where Murphy, he was talking about D.L. Hall Okay, after the start on Saturday. D.L. Hall's performance. And Pat Murphy was asked by Adam McCalvey from Brewers.com if D.L. Hall essentially will continue to make starts. And Murphy said there's got to be adjustments. We're not going to keep rolling out the ball, throw three and a third, and say that's fine. It's not acceptable. But he is a young kid. And, I mean, he, he called a spade a spade. You know, we as fans can kind of see that. And once in a while we joke around, it's like, oh, yeah, that's typical coach speak. Or that's typical, you know, manager speak, general manager speak. Like today, when we hear from Brian Gutekunst, we're going to hear a lot of typical general manager speak. It's not going to be very open on a lot of stuff. Maybe we'll get a little bit of a nugget here or there, but likely, probably not, with the draft opening up in, in a few days. But as fans, I think, you know, we appreciate it a little bit more when we, and I know probably the media members who covered the team, appreciate it a little bit more when you hear a coach or a general manager who maybe gives you a little bit more of a peek behind the curtain or he's a little bit more honest and a little bit more open and I also and, and he's speaking the truth like he you know I feel like sometimes as fans when we hear this coach speak or this general manager speak sometimes we feel like okay we're not dumb you know when it's a very generic answer and there's benefits to, to it you know maybe you don't want to call out somebody in the media or or public and you just kind of keep it behind closed doors or that but I mean Murphy called it what it called it it's not acceptable right now, you know, with, with the performance of D.L. Hall. He called out himself, said, I was dead wrong about this player. You know, he easily could have said something like, yeah, you know, when uh, he was coming up, kind of saw some things, but he had to continue to grow and, and get better, and now he's just taking advantage of his opportunity. 
typical coach speak. Dude is going out there, and I think fans appreciate his open openness and his honesty in a lot of a lot of areas. And honestly, maybe this team does too. Maybe the players do. I mean, Pat Murphy right now is fourteen and six. I feel like this is a team, this Brewers team, that's playing off of the philosophy, the 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 personality of their of their manager. Fourteen and six, second most wins to begin. You know, in, in the first twenty games, was it uh, fourteen wins in the first twenty games as manager, tied for the second most in Brewers history, for 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 Pat Murphy. We're seeing different things with this team. I know there's a little bit more of a youth movement. There's different players, and I'm not trying to draw comparisons to what Craig Council did over the years for for the Brewers because it's just 20 games. But it is evident we are seeing some different things. We are are seeing different philosophical ideas. Offense has changed up a little bit. Obviously, the pitching is different because you don't have a Corbin or a Brandon Woodruff out there to throw every five days. But we are seeing different things. We're seeing, okay, we know the pitching may not be as deep, especially in from the starting spot. We don't have our all-star closer. So we're seeing adjustments. We're, we're seeing a team that's like, okay, let's try to make it harder on the opposing team then put a little bit more stress. We're going to steal some bases. We're going to get on base more and be aggressive on those base paths. Because you know what? Last year, maybe we can get by by being a little conservative on the offensive side because we're going to play really good defense and have really good pitching. Let's try to make it a little bit easier on our pitching staff and maybe be a little bit more aggressive on the offensive side. I think we're seeing that with this Brewers team so far. And they're off to a fantastic start. 14-6, and six, I don't think anybody expected this from, from the crew. I don't think anybody thought this. Now you got the Pirates coming up here and... I don't think the Brewers are going to sweep the Pirates, although that would be freaking awesome to to see that if it were to be the case. But this is a team, this is a young team that's playing with a lot of confidence right now, and I think they believe in their manager, and I think they believe in themselves. What did what did Pat Murphy say right at the close of, of spring training? He says something like, be careful with this team because they might just start to believe. And I think... That he nailed it on that right now. This is a team right now that's that's believing themselves. It's only twenty games in. You got over a hundred and forty more of these to go for for this. It's gonna be there's gonna be some downers. There's gonna be some low points. But you know when you look at how the Brewers, you know Padres, they lost that series. They were on a three game losing streak, and then last Wednesday it looked like maybe it was gonna be a four game losing streak. When they were being no hit through seven, they squeaked out that victory, and it's like they carried that momentum into this weekend series. I'm excited to see this team not to overlook Pittsburgh because this is a big early divisional series, but I'm excited to see this Brewers team go up against the Yankees in Milwaukee. Yankees, we know Soto's off to a fantastic start, home run ball and such. Aaron Judge, we know, right? Brewers are a little bit different. They're putting up some great offensive numbers. Tops and a lot of offensive statistics. But I'm excited to see how the Brewers go about things and how the Yankees go about things and seeing these two teams match up this weekend. But first, let's try to take as many games as we can against Pittsburgh. Win your division games here. We'll love to take three out of four against Pittsburgh. Maybe a split is a little bit more reasonable. I don't know. I mean, got a team that's 14 and 6 right now. Let's have a little higher expectations, I guess, Dan, here for, you know, not just say, all right, let's at least take two out of two. Let's take three out of four. Why not? You got Ross that's going to be on the mound. He's going to be looking to bounce back tonight. Your, your pitching lineups. Miley is going to get to start on Tuesday. A little TBD action on Wednesday. TBD on Thursday. And I think, if it were me at least, if you could do it, see if Freddie can get that start against the Yankees on, on Friday. I'd, I'd like to see Freddie get a start against the Yankees. 
And that's going to do it for us on this episode of the Man Cave Podcast. Big thanks for tuning in. And as always, if you haven't uh, rated or reviewed it, if you could get, take a few seconds to give us a five-star rating and a positive review so others can find the podcast. Until next time, I'm Dan Casper, and I'll talk to you on the next episode of the Man Cave Podcast.